Hi, this is Regaline Sabat, also known as Gigi. You're listening to Walk With Me Podcast. My guest today is Michelle Jewsbury. Michelle Jewsbury is an international philanthropist, speaker, author, and coach who has traveled the world as an advocate for the less fortunate. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Thank you so much, Gigi. I'm super excited to be here. You're welcome. It's an honor to have you here today. Now, why don't you start off by telling us about you and where you're from? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, as Gigi said, my name is Michelle Jewsbury, and I currently live in Los Angeles, California. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into who I am and what I'm about, but I'm pretty sure you're going to ask those questions. So I'll just leave it simple. I, uh, you know, run a nonprofit, and I speak on stages all around the world, and I'm an author as well. I love it. Now, tell us more about the major challenge you had to overcome in your life, such as domestic violence. Yeah, so... Um, in 2011, I end up moving to Hollywood, California because I want to be a movie star. I love acting. I love the entertainment industry. And um, I had a passion for being on stage and in front of the camera. And things were going really well when I moved to Hollywood. And I was praised and starring in independent films. And um, I ended up meeting this guy, blonde hairs, blue eyed. Uh, swept me off my feet. And I thought he was going to be my Prince Charming. And about four months into that relationship was the first sign of physical violence. And my head went through the drywall. And when that happened to me, I didn't realize, I didn't understand that this was the beginning stages of a domestic violence relationship. I remember uh, when that incident happened and uh, we'll call my abuser, Paul, and he pushed me so hard that my head bounced and caused a huge indentation. And all I remember is stepping forward and behind me and thinking, I have to patch the hole, not I have to run. Well, I stayed with my abuser for roughly four years. And during those four years, I endured psychological manipulation, financial abuse, sexual abuse, and a lot of physical violence. When I left, I sat in front of my computer, like we're doing now, Gigi, and I began documenting what happened to me and just typing out and really getting out of my soul what I had experienced. And at that moment in my life, I had an aha moment. It was, gosh, I can't believe what I'm reading is about me. Well, I ended up writing and performing a 65 minute solo show about my experience called But I Love Him and performed in the 2016 Hollywood Fringe Festival and also the White Fire Solo Fest. And that's when people started coming up to me and telling me what they experienced. And thank you so much for speaking up because you've now spoke up, now I can speak up. So I knew that I was on the right track to doing what my purpose was in life. And then from there, I ended up starting a nonprofit organization called Unsilenced Voices, where we help survivors of domestic violence, sexual abuse, and human trafficking worldwide, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Rwanda. We can talk more about that in a bit. And then I wrote my first book, which is the uh, same title as my play called But I Love Him, but different. And we can talk more about that as well. But I, I just, I love what I do. I get to coach people. I get to speak with people and encourage people that you are not trapped in your circumstances. You can overcome any challenge that is presented. And it's all, you know, changing your mindset and accepting what's happened, recognize what you've gone through. So you can really take that next step forward because you can overcome obstacles. I love it. Now, Rosalind here, she says, amazing testimony. I love it. Thank you yes. so much. Yes, and I, I, I met Rosalind yesterday, so uh, it was great when I was speaking on um, a, a summer a summit, uh, Discover the Inner You. Uh, great, great summit, and it was amazing to meet Rosalind. So thank you. Very good to see you. <laughs> yes, it was absolutely a, an amazing two-day retreat. So I'm glad we were both a part of that, and Rosalind was as well. And here she is. She says, you are truly a jewel as well. <laughs> I love it. Now, Michelle, can you tell us more about your 501c3 nonprofit Unsilenced Voices that you founded? Yeah, of course. So um, when I had decided that I knew that I needed to do more, I was actually vice president for a nonprofit organization called Young Vision Africa. And I ended up traveling uh, to Sierra Leone, and this was 2015, I believe, yes, 2015. 
And I ended up talking to individuals, uh, women, primarily two different groups of women. Um, one group was elders in the community, and then the other group um, were young college girls. And we talked about domestic violence in their country and sexual abuse in their country. And it told me how bad it was. So when I got back to the States, I decided to leave my vice presidency from Young Vision Africa and decided to dedicate my time helping survivors of domestic violence, volunteering my time for about six months on Skid Row at the Downtown Women's Center. Now, I thought I was going to be working there, and I it, that never happened, and God had a different trajectory for my life. And I ended up flying up to Oakland to interview for another nonprofit called Art and Abolition. Great nonprofit. I didn't feel like I didn't feel like I could, I was supposed to be there. I, I, I felt that God's presence was, a, was within that organization, but I wasn't supposed to be there. So then the next day, you know, I walk around the streets of San Francisco and uh, if you know me at all, I love my wine. So I had my glass of Chardonnay and I ate my clam chowder on Pier 39 and, and a guy came up to me and we just started talking and I told him my story. And he said, you know, you should start a nonprofit. And that wasn't the first time I heard that, but it was the time I finally decided to listen. And we're a 501c3 within a month and I was in Ghana two months later. Absolutely amazing. I love it. Yeah. Now you mentioned God, how important is your relationship with God to you? So I ended up finding Christ in 2010, uh, actually through drug, drug addiction. And you, I, I'm an open, I'm very transparent. I talk a lot about my struggles and challenges. Uh, but when I met God, I initially thought that life was going to completely change. And that's not the way it goes. It's a journey, right? It's a journey to find him through hope and um, uh, love and faith. And I ended up getting involved in violence relationship after I was baptized. So after I had found God, I used to go on hikes and scream hell at God. Why, Jesus? Why is this happening to me? Why can't you just fix Paul? Why is he the way he is? And lo and behold, I thought I was so alone, but I wasn't alone. I was carrying through that. And what I do now is all based on how God has led me to speak up about my experiences. So it's all him, 100% all him. So I love God very, very, very much. <laughs> I love it. Very powerful. Now tell us more about your book, But I Love Him. My yeah. What was your next thought when you wrote that? <sighs> yeah, this book. Oh, my goodness. Um, so But I Love Him, if you guys can see right here. Um, this was literally my documentation of my abusive relationship. And when I literally sat in front of my computer and started to write and it came out in play format at first, I knew that I had to translate it into a book. Now the play was about 75% accurate because of theatrical reasons. Uh, but my book is a hundred percent outside of some name changes and location changes. Uh, but I really go into detail about the abuse, about what happened to me, about the sexual assault, the physical violence, the, the multiple beatings that I, but lots and lots of statistics about how you can overcome the challenges that you're faced with in domestic violence, primarily, um, and why it happens, why there is the cycle of domestic violence. And I ended up trying to find a publisher and at the time, I was going through a lawsuit with my abuser. So a lot of publishers turned me down. My abuser would come after them. And when I finally was able to publish, was, which was last year, by the way, in 2019, um, it was liberating, extremely liberating, because I was able to get my out there. I was able to speak up, and I was able to regain the power that Paul had taken from me, all by speaking up and telling my truth. And that's what my book is all about. That's what But I Love Him is all about. It's um, it's about what can happen after you speak up, the positives that can happen when you let go of everything that you're holding on to and you're able to share your experiences so that other people 
can break free from just that they face. So there's but I love him in a nutshell. Amen. Your voice truly matters. I love it. Now, Ragnis and Nika, she actually connected you and I. <laughs> I love it. She says here, so glad to see the speed of implementation. I love it. Hello, Ragnis. Thank you for listening in. 24 hours. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. We love it. <laughs> now, Michelle, can you tell us more about the major challenge you had to overcome in your life, such as sexual assault? Yeah, so... Uh, you and I briefly spoke on the phone yesterday about that experience, and uh, I'm, I'm going to actually be on your panel coming up uh, here at the end of the week. I'm very, very excited about that. So yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't typically talk about the sexual violence that happened to me, primarily because it just doesn't come up very often. But I'm more than happy to discuss it, like I told you on the phone yesterday, and it's in my book. So when I was, when I was with Paul at a hotel, he started to uh, drink too much and freak out. And I knew that I was in trouble, right? And I knew at that moment when I saw the black in his eyes and the blue completely leave that he was going to hurt me like he had hurt me in the past. Well, I didn't understand what else he was going to do. And when he ripped my clothes off and found and took the belt buckle belt out of his pants, um, I started to scream and granted we were at a hotel, but we were at a very swanky hotel in Hollywood. So my screams were competing with, um, the nightclub music down below. And if anybody did hear me, they decided not to, not to do anything. And I used to battle with myself about it being an actual rape. Um, I used to tell myself because he didn't penetrate me with his genital area that it wasn't rape. However, after years of therapy and understanding that rape is actually, it doesn't have to be even penetration, but it could be by anything. Um, I understood that that's exactly what I had experienced. And he, um, he uh, forced himself on me and, um, I, I was able after probably five to 10 minutes to kind of swirl out of it. Uh, but then that's when the, the beating really got worse. But um, yeah, he, uh, he hurt me, the depths of my soul. And then I was able to, to forgive him. And I think that is exactly what people need to realize is hurt people hurt people. And although I had experienced years and years of beating the sexual assault, um, I knew in order for me to move forward in my life, I had to let go of the grudge and the resentment, the anger that I had for Paul. And I understood that the reason why he hurt me so bad in those four years was that because he is hurting inside. Now, he and I don't speak. We have met, we have not been on speaking terms for over five years. Like I said, I was involved in a, in a lawsuit with him that was, um, settled outside of court. And um, one of the stipulations that I was like, you know, I can't say who he is really, um, but I do hope and pray that he is getting the help that he needs. Uh, because I believe that narcissistic abusers and sexual offenders can heal from what they do. And it's all about looking internal and healing themselves so they can bring other people around them. Amen. Now, oftentimes individuals who are sexually assaulted, both men and women, they tend to blame themselves. What would you tell the individuals who may be in that, you know, thought process right now, blaming themselves and wanting to give up or maybe even thinking about committing suicide? What would you tell those individuals? You're not alone. So when I was involved in my abusive relationship, I left my abuser six, seven, eight different times. And I felt I was so alone. I felt like what he was telling me, the, I love you, I promise I won't do it again, but the also, you can't have anything more than me because I am what you deserve, right? He used gas lamp, gaslighting to uh, make me believe that he was the best and make me believe that I triggered him and that I remembered situations differently than what they actually happened. And I thought I was going crazy for that relationship. I literally thought to myself, is it me? Am I doing this? 
And this is why I didn't speak up during those four years. Nobody knew what I was enduring. Nobody knew how bad the abuse really was. And then when we broke up, when I finally escaped, I didn't even realize I was escaping domestic violence at the time, but we had split up and he still wanted to control me. So he financially controlled me still for a year afterwards. And when I started writing, that's really when I was able to get my power back. And when I realized that I can come this and I'm not alone and that no matter how bad it hurts right now, especially leaving your abuser, because I know how incredibly difficult that can be. It was never my fault. It's never your fault. And I can have a beautiful life outside of the experiences that I went through, outside of the sexual violence, the physical abuse, the emotional manipulation. And it wasn't my fault for triggering him. And he is just hurting. And because of that, he had hurt me. Very powerful. Now you mentioned gaslighting. Can you tell us more about that for the individuals who don't know what that is? Yeah, of course. Um, so gaslighting is say, uh, I'll use an example. Say you go to a party. I mean, we haven't gone to parties since March because COVID, but <laughs> party and say you go with uh, just a girlfriend of yours, you and a girlfriend and your girlfriend is a little abrasive sometimes and uh, maybe a little verbally abusive to you. Well, you guys go to this party and for some reason got triggered by something. Maybe she drank too much and danced with somebody that she thought that she liked. Well, what happens next is that she will start to blame you and make you think that what you did was wrong and that what you did was even more than what you remember doing. So maybe she might make you believe that he kissed you when that never actually happened, okay? So gaslighting in a domestic violence relationship is my, Paul would always make me believe things that happened that didn't happen or make me believe that whatever I remembered was inaccurate and not true and that it didn't happen. So he would um, really start to make me think and believe the way that he thought. So one prime example was October 2016, I re, or October 2012, not 16. I received one of the worst beatings from him. It was four hours long. I was black and blue, bloodied. Um, in the morning after drifting in and out of consciousness, when I woke up, he looked at me and began to cry. And my face literally looked like I had just completed 12 rings in a boxing match. And he told me that it wasn't as bad as what it looked. And I believed him. He actually went through, and this was something that I, I recently have remembered, and covered all of the mirrors in our house. So I couldn't actually look at my face. It was puffy. And I remember that you couldn't even see the white in my right eye. And it actually stayed pink for nine months after the people thought that I had jaundice. It turned yellow and uh, thank God it went away. But he would tell me it's not as bad as you think. And I remember going to a restaurant with him probably about a week after this beating. And of course I'm wearing sunglasses and a hat and covering the bruises on my face. Um, and I had asked the waitress for a glass of wine. And the waitress looked at me and said, can you please remove your sunglasses so I can compare your ID to your face and make sure that and you're legally allowed to drink. You're 21 and over. And when I removed my sunglasses, I remember her reaction. She was just startled, moved back. And she's like, I'm so sorry, miss. Here you go. And went and grabbed my wine. And that's when I realized that, holy crap, it is as bad as I think. And he has been lying to me about the injuries, about the bruising, about how I actually look to other people. And um, that's just one form of gaslighting, but it is. It's. Uh, I see Rosalind saying it's very deceptive. And yeah, she has a question here. She said, "So gaslighting is deception or manipulation?" Um, you know, I actually don't believe uh, narcissistic abusers consciously understand what they're doing, because there wouldn't be similarity 
lives in every single relationship like if they consciously knew what was happening. I think gaslighting is more of a subconscious thing that happens to manipulate you. And it's not necessarily to deceive, but it's to manipulate you in a way that you won't run away, that you won't tell anybody, that you won't call the police. It's a protective mechanism. So um, my belief, my theory, Gaslighting is something that just comes from within because of the pain that they've experienced. So they make other people around them at blame for their circumstances. So it's more of them not on responsibility for the actions that they have done. So it is deceptive, but it's more of an unconscious level. So it's more manipulation. Perfect. She says, okay, I see. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now, of course, of course. also in regards to domestic violence, what are some signs and red flags you would tell the audience to look out for? Uh, well, there's a variety. So with Paul, it's, uh, I remember I was with a girlfriend and I was walking through a stop, uh, an intersection. It was a stoplight, we were in the crosswalk. And I was telling her about my relationship with Paul and and I immediately felt this, this heaviness, this burden, this, this immediate no that I heard from God. It literally was a distinct no I heard in my mind. No, stay away. No, he's not good. And I chose to ignore my intuition. Now, when you have an intuition that something is not right, typically it's not right. It's, it's like the saying, when something is too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. I mean, you have to work towards things to make them the way they are. It's a journey. Everything's a process. But when all of a sudden you fall in love and in four months you want to get married and he wants to move you up, up north and, and isolate you from your friends and your family and, and buy a car for you, make you quit your job, all of that is not good. All of that is actually a sign of, of domestic violence, but right before it gets physical. It's more manipulation and control, right? So one of the other signs is I used to go to dinner with Paul and he wouldn't let me order for myself. And now I'm, if you know me, I'm a strong, independent woman. My mom raised me to speak up and to speak my mind. But for some reason, he was able to control me so much because I was so in love with the idea of him being my knight in shining armor and him being... Um, the, the, the prince on the white horse that's going to come rescue me, right? And I was, I was really swallowing and taking in everything he said. So I allowed him to not allow a voice. A lot of that was, you know, he would order. He also talked to the waitress and bartenders like he um, was hot HIT, like he was all that and a can of beans or however you say that saying. Um, so it's... It's really noticing how he speaks to the people around you. And also do some research, you guys. These things, I'm holding the phone if you're listening to this and not, and not watching, but these things uh, have more computing power than things did 20, 30, 40 years ago. We can look up somebody at the, at the uh, hit of a button and all you gotta do is do some research. You know, find out what he's been doing. Look him up on social media. Find out what his friends and family say about him. Meet his friends. You know, when I met Paul's friends, they used to warn me. And I thought the warning was more jealousy, but they used to warn me, oh, be careful. You know, you're just the next chick for Paul and da, 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 da. And, um, you know, a couple of them actually witnessed some of the violence. And they warned me and I chose not to listen. And then isolation, of course, run away as soon as he starts to isolate you um, because trying to move away from your friends and family and tell you who you can and cannot hang out with is a form of abuse. Um, so those are just a handful of red flags. There are a lot more in my book, but I love him. And also on unsilencedvoices.org, you can look at some of those red flags as well. Very powerful. Research truly matters. I love it. Thank you for raising awareness in regards to that. Now, Michelle, how did you make the decision to leave that relationship? When did you make that decision? 
When did it, when did it, your aha moment? Yeah, so I actually get that question uh, every interview that I do. And there was actually two. Um, typically, there has to be some type of breaking point to break free from the abuse. And that breaking point for me, the first breaking point, was when I found out he was having affairs on me. So subconsciously, I was allowing him to physically harm me, emotionally abuse me, sexually assault me, financially control me. But as soon as he cheated on me, I lost my mind. I just, I couldn't take it. When I found out, I literally drank a ton of alcohol. Um, I, I was rolling around on the kitchen floor, just crying and crying and crying. And he would come behind me with a pillow take me to the bathroom if I had to puke like I was really upset and um, I'm so sorry you know I didn't think that it was going to hurt you like this and it's all ended now and I mean I don't believe those lies now but at the time I was hoping that what he was telling me was truthful and um, I knew that I, I needed to back away from him for a and I, I asked him um, I asked him you know can I I'm, I want to leave I want to go back to Los Angeles for a little while and we can still stay in contact and et cetera, et cetera. And he said, okay. And he actually let me go. And that's not the case with a lot of uh, narcissistic abusers and people in domestic violence. Groups. But I presented a case where we would still be very good friends. And I knew that I, I had to stay in contact with him at the time because I was financially worried. He had got me in $70,000 in debt, including a car that I couldn't pay for. And, um, uh, I was, I was concerned, you know, I had a score of like 820 and now it's demolished because of the things that I have gone through. But um, that was the first breaking point. So then I stayed in contact with him and uh, we were texting back and forth and he was still controlling me. The last year we were together, but not together. Father died and I also tore my ACL and had to have surgery. So he used to tell me that he still wanted to take care of me. Well, little did I know he started dating another woman and um, I messaged from her in November of 2015. And in November, she had said that my head through the glass window in the bathroom. And we had gotten into an altercation. And the police got involved. And I'm pressing charges. And at that moment, I had a decision to make. Was I going to continue silence? leaving the opportunity for him to harm other people and not speak up and help her? Or was I going to start speaking up, take my power back, quit worrying about the financial implications and quit worrying about the little mundane things that we all worry about and concern ourselves with? Was I going to start to speak up, not just for myself, but for other people? And as you can see, that's what I chose. You know, I chose to help. I chose to... Um, combat him so that he could have some form of repercussion so he could heal and quit doing what he was doing to a variety of women multiple women he had done this to and it took a lot of courage and i want you out there to know that if you are going through abuse and domestic violence or any type of trauma whatsoever it's hard it is not something easy to escape so I want you to know that. However, you can do it because you are more important than everybody else around you. And the only person that can help you is you. You have to speak up. You have to press those charges. You have to get those restraining orders. But oh my gosh, once you do, you really feel like you have your power back, that you can accomplish anything in the world. And that's what I felt when, when, I, when I first started speaking up that, wow, I can do this. And I, I used to be so scared that, you know, he used to tell me he would kill me all the time. And apartment building and coming back uh, after bar, um, I used to take it to the second floor. And I used to think when the elevator doors would open, that there would be a man behind there with a gun and would kill me. But I knew that my story was so big that I couldn't not share it. I had to share it, just like your story, just like Gigi, your story. And this is why you do what you do. You have to share it. And I worked through that fear and I got the therapy that I needed and I still see a therapist. I do a lot of private coaching. So when I hear trauma, of course, sometimes I get triggered. So I got to talk to a therapist too. 
There's nothing wrong with that. Nobody is perfect. As long as you keep putting one foot in front of the other every single day and make today better than it was yesterday. Amen. Very powerful. Now, Michelle, can you tell us more about some of the projects that you're currently working on? Yeah, definitely. So we are looking for helpers, donors, fundraisers, grant writers for Unsilenced Voices. We are, like I said, in Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Rwanda. We work with uh, partner organizations that are actually led by uh, Sierra Leoneans and Ghanaians, you know, and uh, a Rwanda, uh, Rwanda um, nonprofit organization based there because I think it's super important not to bring Western values, but to just make better what they already have, make aware of some of the things that could potentially get fixed, right? The injustice that happen. Well, our programming really, really well in all three of those countries. Well, in Ghana, we would really like to raise 80,000 to be able to give to the shelter there since they are the only domestic violence shelter in Accra, Ghana, to help them with their needs and help the women and the children that go through there. In Rwanda, we'd love to expand. Right now, we're sending about six, $700 a month over there, and we'd like to expand and be able to travel there and have more team members and more education and sensitizations and possibly create some type of shelter. And then in Sierra Leone, uh, that's where the base, the, the, the major programming that we have is in Sierra Leone. We do sex worker education. We do village education, community education, market sensitizations. We do uh, part, we partnered with a uh, vocational training center where we pay for young girls uh, who have worked in the sex industry to you know, leave the streets and learn a skill so they can sell you know, what they bake or they make instead of their bodies. Um, we, we do a lot of things in, in Sierra Leone and, and I, for us to be able to create some type of shelter, there's an organization in Sierra Leone, uh, Commit and Act Foundation, and I would love to be able to partner with them and expand on their existing shelter because they are Sierra Leonean led and that's what's important. One of the main things that we're doing here in the United States though is um, we are working on a domestic violence awareness tour. We need to raise roughly $400,000, put together an entire tour for a year. So if you know out there that you are good at fundraising, if you're good at grant writing, if, um, if you have any of those expertise and you want to give back to a nonprofit that is really giving back to so many people led by a survivor. So I know what people are feeling and thinking and the, the obstacles that they're facing, please reach out. Um, unsilencedvoices.org. Please, please, please reach out. Uh, besides that, I'm doing a lot of speaking engagements. So I have been on almost 50 virtual summits and podcasts since March uh, and just speaking. I'm traveling to Vegas uh, this weekend. I'm going to be attending and also speaking at the Rainmaker Summit with Power Team International and Bill Walsh. Uh, from there, I'm going to be competing in a uh, speaker competition with Kristoff called the Ultimate Speaker Competition, which is going to be fun. And that's where I'm going to share a lot about unsilenced voices and get people there. And um, I'm just speaking on stages. You know, I speak in front of colleges and universities, uh, in front of small and large audiences, just to get your word out, you know, get the word out. Because if you are a business owner and entrepreneur, you know, 50% of the people that you employ women and one in three of those women have experienced some type of significant violence and trauma. So how do you deal with that? How do they deal with that and still be able to perform at optimum um, performance that you want for your business? How can everybody in your community, in your network, um, in your business, be able to support each other so you can have even more success? So that's what I speak about as well. Thank you. Now, Roslyn Willis says here, I would love to volunteer. And she says, yes, I would love to partner and help you with that. Perfect. I would love that. Uh, Roslyn, I think you and I already connected on uh, Messenger. But if anybody's out there, um, the email is easy. It's Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at unsilencedvoices.org. So go ahead and reach out to me. We can schedule a time to chat. Um, and if you are experiencing trauma, I also do complimentary consultations to help you overcome those issues as well. And we can, can talk about that as well. Very powerful. Now, Michelle, tell us more about your greatest accomplishment in your life. Hmm. Does it have, can it be fun? 
<laughs> yeah, of course, it could be fun. <laughs> um, so I, this is more of uh, like my favorite thing to do in the whole white world. And um, when I was um, trying to heal myself, I did a lot of traveling. And I ended up traveling to Australia and I learned how to scuba dive. I went through the training and the process and it's many, many hours of work and work on work in the, and I learned to scuba dive and I love being under the water. It's, um, it's exhilarating. And I was able to actually live on a boat uh, called the, uh, the new Nor Norseman called the Norseman. I had to, I have to get it correct because it was an amazing experience. So if you ever want to do it, look up the Norseman. Um, and I lived on this boat for a week with five people. I was the fifth. So it was, you know, five total people on a boat for a week. And we scuba dived every day, twice a day, uh, sometimes three times a day. And then afterwards we uh, ate amazing Italian food because this was in the middle of the Mediterranean off the coast of the island of Elba in Italy and um, ate a and, and then drank lemoncellos and wine. And it was just a super fun experience. But it is one of my um, biggest achievements because I did it for me, right? I, I decided that I wanted to learn how to scuba dive for me because being under the water and looking up when you're 40 meters down and seeing seeing the sky and reaching your hand up thinking that that you could see and feel the top in the air but you're so far under the water it, it's just it's amazing absolutely amazing and and scuba diving is very healing to me and i encourage you guys to do something for you your biggest achievement doesn't have to be starting a nonprofit or writing a book it can be something that you have done for yourself and i think that that is so incredibly important is self care. If you don't take care of yourself, how can you take care of other people? If you don't for yourself, if you don't use great words for you, how are you going to use great words for other people? So take care of yourself. Go outside, find something that you love to do, and go out and do it. That's right. And do it. I love that. And thank you for sharing that story with us. I felt like you walked us through like we were actually there. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, Very no, being under the water is so much fun. Like I, I mean, I've seen, I've dove with sharks, I've uh, seals, you name it. It, it was, it, it's been really a huge eel. Like I got scared one time because this eel was, um, he was probably, let's see, I'm five, four. He was probably six and a half feet. I mean, huge eel, and it was so kind of scary. But of course, I'm like swimming around and want to follow him, and not realizing that this eel could hurt me. And I have my little GoPro, and I'm like trying to see. And I, I'm right here, and all of a sudden, I turn this direction, and the eel's face is right here. I'm like, ah, you know, underwater. And, but it's so much fun having those experiences. And whether you have those experiences by yourself with God and the universe, with friends and family members or somebody that you love and care about, just go out and have those experiences. Yes, fun matters. I love that you just wrote that. We teach faith fun or family faith fun, exactly what uh, Bill Walsh teaches and talks about as well, but fun matters. I mean, make sure to schedule your fun first because that's how you can heal. That's that's how you overcome the BS that happens, being a lot of BS. You know, as you know, Gigi, you're laughing at everybody experiences some type of hurt, pain, trauma. I mean, we're all human. That's right. Well, in order to move past that, you really got to give yourself the time, the quality that you want other people to give you. When you start to value who you are, other people around you start to value you as well and also themselves. You know, I also love going to the beach, as you can tell. I love water, you know, do some writing, reflective writing, stream of consciousness writing, where you just get out what's in your mind. It's so healing and therapeutic, and you never know what can out of you taking care of yourself, especially right now during this worldwide pandemic that we are all experiencing with stay at home orders, with um, scarcity mindsets. Uh, being worried about your finances, being worried about where you're going in life. 
take care of you because in those moments when you start to set yourself free, you start to clear your mind and allow other innovative ideas to come in. So say right now you don't have a job, you lost your employment, you barely are getting any unemployment, if any, or any help from the state, and you're worried, how am I going to live? Well, instead of sitting in that worry, go and reflect and talk to the universe and be with God. And, and when that happens, ideas start to pop into your brain. And those are not by accident. You are calling into the atmosphere, the world what you are expecting for yourself. And if you expect to treat yourself well, the universe is going to treat you well as well. That's right. Now, Rosalind says, my saying, know your worth and give no discounts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she also says, laughter is a good medicine for the soul. How, how important is laughter, Michelle? It, it, oh, it's so important. It's so important. Um, I, I laugh a lot, you know. I I actually have laugh lines and laugh lines up here. Um, but Wait, it's, let me zoom in. Hold on. <laughs> um, but who cares? It's character, right? I'm not going to go and get Botox to cover up laugh lines. But no, it is. It's so incredibly important to laugh because if you don't laugh, if you don't have fun, then what is the point of being here? You know, you can't leave this planet with anything material, right? We're only leaving the planet with a legacy that we've left behind, what we've done, uh, our accomplishments, who we've left things to, uh, how we've been able to impact and help other people. But when we die, we, we don't get to take anything behind except for our experiences. And our experiences are what creates laughter and love and permission to just be with other people and yourself. And it doesn't matter if you, you know, live in a trailer park in North Idaho, or if you're in a huge mansion on Rodeo Drive, the same medicine for your soul is laughter and being with your friends and your family and loving and caring for one another and telling just talking talking story about what's happened in your past and uh the fun things you know i i talk a lot about you know my cheerleading days and looking at old videos and it makes me laugh because it's so important to do that find somebody uh people that you love to be around i've got a really great friend right now um he is uh he makes me laugh a lot and I, I don't know where it's going, uh, but he makes me laugh and, uh, you know, makes me, makes me feel like that life can be fun. Continue surrounding yourself with people like that because life is meant to be fun, no matter what challenge that we have gone through. Amen. That's right. Fun matters and laughter matters. Thank you. Now, Michelle, what change do you wish to see in the world? Oh, well, there's a lot. Um, like I said in the beginning, there are a lot of injustices on this planet. Uh, what I like to tell people is you don't have to have a passion for what I do, but you have to have a passion for something. There are so many people, especially in first world countries, that go to their nine to five, get off work, sit in front of their television, drink their beer, maybe play with their child for an hour, go back to sleep and do it all over again. Our lives are meant for something even more. Our lives are meant to contribute to giving back, to helping. So if I wasn't doing what I would be doing, which I'm going to still try to figure out how to implement this with what I do, I hate plastic. Like plastic is horrible. Plastic and styrofoam are the worst things for this planet. I remember walking in Ghana and just seeing mounds and mounds of styrofoam and plastic and kids playing on those piles of filth that are not going to decompose anytime soon. Well, I 
hate plastic, so I'm an advocate in speaking up against the use of single-use plastics. But choose something else. It could be animal rights. It could be climate change. It could be uh, the environment and, and, and oil and you name it. There are so many injustices, right? Whether it's women's empowerment, Black Lives Matter, racism, um, uh, uh, social inequality, so many different things. Just choose something and speak up about it. That's what I want to see, because if everybody who could would speak up, would encourage other people to change, then we would not be where we are right now in this world. Our world would be a better place with less human trafficking, less abuse, uh, child abuse, domestic violence, you name it. There are so many things and they're all increasing right now because of the stay-at-home orders and COVID, speak up, speak up. You know, we should not be fracking right now. We shouldn't be using single-use plastics. We we should care for the environment. You know, go outside, take a deep breath. If you want your children to experience this amazing world, we have to start taking care of it. So I know I went off on a, on a little tangent there. I'm so sorry, Gigi. Uh, but there are a lot of things that I'm passionate about. And I just encourage people to choose something. Not a problem. Thank you for raising awareness about that. Now, you also mentioned human trafficking. What advice would you tell to those individuals? Or what, what would you raise awareness in regards to human trafficking to the audience? So first off, I want to say that I don't have firsthand experience in human trafficking. However, uh, there's an organization that we are partnering with, uh, who is an amazing organization and it's called Beyond Freedom International. And it's led by a survivor of human trafficking and she was trafficked up and down the 405 freeway for over 10 years. Are um, you referring to Janelle? Yeah, Janelle Gordon. Mm -hmm. I know Janelle, she's yeah. absolutely amazing. She is, and she is a very strong willed woman who speaks up about what she's gone through. Well, what I learned with working with her and speaking with her and speaking on summits and stages with her is that the way that people get involved in human trafficking is very similar to the way they get involved in domestic violence. And the pimp or the perpetrator will adorn you with gifts and tell you how beautiful you are, and, um, uh, you know, encourage you in, in other ways, get your nails done and et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a big incident that happens, whether it's a gang rape, or uh, a big assault, um, uh, something happens to where they will blame the victim, the young girl, but blame the victim for whatever they want to blame her for and say, well, now you owe me money for this and I will kill your friends, kill your family if you don't repay this. And that's how they get forced into that line of work. And there's another organization, uh, uh, Child Liberation Foundation that travels all over the world and rescue, rescues young children who are being trafficked and um, helps to rehabilitate them and, and get them back into society, but outside of the traffickers' hands. And the one thing that I do want to tell your audience is that human trafficking is a real thing. And it's a multi, multi-billion dollar a year industry. And human trafficking is increasing right now. And I, I think it's because there are more kids at home, maybe more children who are running away. Traffickers oftentimes prey on uh, juveniles and foster care children. Love kids, love them no matter what, listen to them. And when I'm all the way up to 18, 19 years old, they're still kids. Listen to them, talk with them, encourage them because when somebody comes around them that tries to traffic them, that tries to trap them, they can recognize those red flags and they can leave that before it gets any worse. But there's over 200,000 kids in the US and over 18 million children worldwide that are being trafficked right now. And it's increasing. Those numbers are astounding and disgusting. And it's time that we do something about that. Amen. Thank you for raising awareness about human trafficking. And a lot of individuals don't believe that it's happening right here in their backyards, but it is yeah, right it is. in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you yeah. for raising awareness about that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I live in Southern California and um, there's a lot of hubs here, you know, Vegas being one, 
um, especially because, you know, prostitution, things like that. Oftentimes those women are forced into that as well. And that's trafficking and, you know, um, big sporting events, big, huge signs of where traffickers will go to traffic, you know, young girls and boys. Um, so yeah, it's all around us. It really is, you know, Orange County, which is supposed to be, you know, a beautiful, amazing place. And I've been there multiple times. I live in Southern California. It's also a big, huge hub for trafficking. And, um, we, we just need to open our eyes because you don't know what you don't know. And when you open your eyes, you become more aware of your surroundings. And sometimes wisdom, um, when you learn things, you wish you didn't learn them. But a wise person will use the wisdom that you've learned for better. Will learn what, will, will accept that what you learn, you can then translate into making change. And that leads me back to choose something uh, because there are so many different things that you can choose to help. Amen. Now, Michelle, tell us more about what gives you happiness in your life. <laughs> well, besides scuba diving. <laughs> um, you know, I love uh, I love going to the beach, like I said. Uh, I live in Southern California for a reason. I love um, uh, the sun. I used to live in Hawaii. Um, I, I, I miss that. I, uh, I, I, I have happiness. My brother was battling a drug addiction for a very, very long time. And after my mom died last year, uh, he kind of, went off the handles, the rails, and um, he's now been sober for over a hundred days. And I'm so thankful and grateful for that. He gives me happiness now. I talk to him and we laugh and we joke and um, he's part of my why. I love to travel. I know we can't do a lot of that right now, but I do, you know, take road trips. Uh, you, you can, you know, take your car and drive someplace. Um, but I love, um, I love animals and elephants and uh, I love sometimes I love to sit down and read. I really love to drink wine, <laughs> like <laughs> drink wine and eat cheese. I really love that. But sitting around and drinking a lot of wine and eating so much cheese, I'm starting to notice that I'm a behind a little bit. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, uh, I do a lot for myself. I sleep. I mean, if you know me, I love sleep. So uh, if I only get seven hours, I am not tip top and I get really hangry and mad and grouchy and I have to get like nine hours of sleep. So I value that and, um, you know, enjoy taking naps and I enjoy my clients and being able to talk to them and encourage them and help them, uh, use, I'm going to use what Jamie R. Wright says, who is one of my clients. And she says, you know, let's turn pain into purpose. And that's exactly what uh, what we teach as well. We help people turn their pain into a purpose, their um, misery into something wonderful, their lemons into lemonade. And um, that those are the perfect clients. You know, T.L. Forsberg is one of them as well. And she um, she is is turning her childhood pain into awareness and advocacy for uh, people less fortunate who are also experiencing some type of disability. So it's just learning how you can make a business out of your intellectual intelligence. And I love helping people do that. It's a lot of fun. Um, but like, you know, like you said, and like you wrote down earlier, have fun. That's what, that's what I enjoy doing is having fun, laughing, wineries, uh, you name it, being outside, spending time with people that make me laugh. So, yeah. I love it. And turn pain into purpose. Very powerful. Now, Michelle, what is your best advice for walking with purpose and living a life of happiness? Um, let go of the small stuff. Definitely let go of the small stuff because in the end, I think, I think the statistic is something upwards of 90% of what we worry about doesn't even happen. So sitting here and fretting and worrying about something that hasn't even happened yet. Um, and then in the, in the future, it may never happen. You are wasting your time. You're wasting time that you could be laughing and spending time and making holiday meals and uh, drinking your Baileys and coffee around a fireplace or whatever it is that you love to do. You're missing out on that time because you're occupying your mind with worry. So let go of the little things. Who cares if, you know, your spouse lost the TV remote? It doesn't need to be yelled about, you know? Who cares if um, you got in a fender bender? Yeah, that sucks. It's a fender bender. Everybody's okay. Let's be jolly and happy and smile still because it's just a vehicle. 
I don't care if you drive a, a Saturn or if you drive a freaking Lamborghini. It's it's a material thing. Let go of it. You know, it's it's not going to define your life, right? And you know, work hard. You work hard so you can play hard. And hard work does not mean longer hours. Hard work just means that the time that you've allotted to work, you spend it doing productive things. You know, lists, time management, schedule your fun first, but make sure you get your work done. And when you get your work done, you kind of are liberated and you can do whatever you want. Um, but yeah, have fun too. Amen. Michelle, thank you so much for being a guest on Walk With Me podcast. Now, where can the audience find you? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much again, Gigi. And it's been so awesome uh, to meet you. And I'm, I'm so excited panel that's coming up uh, this coming weekend. So I hope you, you can share a little bit about that as well, because that's awesome. I'm so honored to be on there. Um, but if you want to find me, I've already mentioned Michelle at unsilencedvoices.org. Uh, however, we do have these things called cell phones. So uh, I teach a five-step process to help people overcome challenges. And I would love to gift that to your audience. And all you do is text the word UNITE, U-N-I-T-E, to 26786. Again, it's just text UNITE to 26786. And you'll receive a complimentary digital download of a PDF that talks about the five steps we teach and how you can overcome challenges. Um, yep, perfect, thank you. Whether it is trauma, depression, anxiety, fear, or you know some business challenges that you may have uh, with employees. But uh, definitely do that, reach out to me and you can find my book, But I Love Him on amazon.com. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure to get Michelle's book, But I Love Him, and also too, to text UNITE, that's U-N-I-T-E and 26786. And also the Global Virtual Panel of Sexual Assault Survivors event that Michelle will be speaking at as well. Uh, it is on Friday the 11th at 6 p.m. So make sure to reserve your seat. I will actually share the link once this ends here in the comment section. I'll go ahead and put the event bright link and reserve your seat. And Michelle, again, thank you so much for being a guest on Walk With Me podcast. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Gigi. Have a great afternoon, you guys. Likewise.